things that has uh, that has been a question in my thought, my thinking for a long time. And a few years ago, Steve Eisberg, I'm going to introduce now, did a teaching to me, to us, some of us leadership uh, in the Water Boys, about what it means to be a man of your word, what it means when you're giving your word about something. We don't do well with that. We don't do well. We're we work in the spirit. So I asked Steve to bring that message today. It's, it's, a, it's a condensed message. He's got lots of material on this and spent a lot of time thinking this through and preparing. So if you would uh, welcome Steve Eisberg. He's the point guy at Crossroads Nazarene in, um, in Ellicott City for men. Uh, he's, he's raised up several tables. He's been part of the table. And uh, he has a word that I think is going to set a context as we move through this training today that's going to help us be able to get our arms around you know, what it means when we give our word. Uh, one thing I did forget to do, pastors, if any of you need to leave, you're, you're welcome to do that. And I uh, want to make sure that we pray over you and, and spoke into you. So if you need to leave, feel free to leave. We'd love to have you be here the whole time. Um, but thank you, Aaron. Let's see. Okay, so Steve, with no further ado, welcome Steve. I Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks. I give you thanks. Um, you have a message today for everyone. That message may be different from one man to the next, but there is a message embedded in this presentation for every man. I'd like to, you to open my heart and my mind to speak that message today. That these words may not be of me, that they may all be of you. That your spirit would move through this room, that your spirit would move in the heart of every man. And his heart, his mind would be open to receive those words as hard as they may be in, in a way that is gentle and loving and meaningful, or that they may penetrate in a gentle and loving, meaningful way, and that they may raise up the authentic man of integrity that is inside each and every one of us when we accept the Spirit of the Lord into our hearts. Let's give you thanks and praise. Yes. Amen. 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 It's good to be here. I, I can't begin to describe the um, the forces that have been trying to keep me from here the last two weeks. I can't begin to describe it, the struggles and, and the warfare that just surrounds this. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I want you to start off by giving yourself a quiz, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10. With 10 being a complete man of, a complete authentic man of integrity. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, rank yourself in, in terms of I am a complete authentic man of integrity. On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you score yourself on that scale as you sit here today? I am a complete authentic man of integrity. So just write down the number 1 to 10. I want to see everybody writing that number down, okay? Write it down. Don't think it. Write it down. Just 1 to 10, just the number. Okay, everybody got your numbers? Okay. Now, I have to offer an acknowledgement here to begin with. Some of this material is drawn from work that was done by Earhart, Jensen, Saffron, and Granger entitled, Being a Leader in the Effective Exercise of Leadership, an Ontological Model. It's, uh, it's a new um, string of thought on leadership and integrity, and I have actually done training in this area. I did the training as a student, as a participant, and then I've, I've done the train the trainer experience, and I'm engaged with this group now for two years at the, the professional level, and have learned a lot. And from the very beginning, as we went through this material, I started to see Jesus in this material, and I think you'll start to see Jesus as well. So when we start anything, when we as Christians and when we as human beings think, okay, what was in the beginning? And as you, you as a Christian, when you ask that question, what was in the beginning? What was in the beginning? What do we know from John 1 was in the beginning? In the beginning was the Word. word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word 
became flesh and dwelt among us. What is in the beginning is the Word. The Word. Well, what do we know about the Word? What are some of the things we know about the Word? If you had to list the things that you know about the Word, what would that list include? Eternal. Eternal. True. 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 Convicting. Shaping. 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 Creating. Trustworthy. Excuse me. Trustworthy. Wise. Rebuking. Rebuking. Well, what do we know about the Word from the Word itself? We know it's flawless and protective, Proverbs 30, verse 5. It's a powerful weapon, isn't it? What's, a, what's the mo one of the most important pieces of our spiritual armor? Our one offensive weapon? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's a weapon. It's alive and it's active, Hebrews 4, 1 John 2. It's the seed of our faith, Luke 8. It's the water that nourishes the seed, Isaiah 55. As the rain falls down from the heavens and waters the earth, so it is with my word, it shall what? It shall not return to me empty. When we pray the word, when we act on the word, that creates something. The name of our Lord and Savior, the word. God will honor it. Isaiah 55, it will not return to him empty. He will respond to it. God will honor his word. Is God an authentic man of integrity? Was Jesus an authentic man of integrity? Yes. So our God is a God of integrity. Now the question we have to deal with is what is integrity for a person? What's integrity for a person? Well, here's what I'm going to present as your definition of integrity for the day. Integrity for a person is a matter of the person's word. Nothing more, nothing less. For a person to have integrity, the word of that person must be, as integrity is defined in the dictionary, whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, and in perfect condition. So for a person to have integrity, the word of that person must be, as integrity is defined in the dictionary, whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, and in perfect condition. So the question is now, in the matter of integrity, what is it that constitutes your word? Can we actually define what is your word? So, your word defined. What you said. Whatever you said you will do or will not do, and in the case of do, doing it on time. Point number one of your word, whatever you said. Note, requests of you become your word unless you respond to them in a timely fashion. So, hey Paul, i got some stuff around the house I'm going to need some help with. Can you come by on Saturday? Sure. Okay, what if Paul says, let me think about it. Okay, then comes Saturday, what can I expect? Under this definition, it's become part of his word because he hasn't responded to me in a timely manner. I can expect him there. Someone gives you a request, you have to respond to it. Amen. Accept, decline. Yes. Or make a counteroffer. Can't help you Saturday, how about Sunday? Absolutely. Okay? Come on. What you know. Whatever you know to do or know not to do, and if it is due, as doing it as you know it is meant to be done, and doing it on time, unless you've explicitly said to the contrary. Unless you've been explicit about it, I'm not going to do that. What is expected? Whatever you are expected to do or not do, and in the case of do, doing it on time, getting a hint here, Unless you've explicitly said to the contrary. So, how many of you are fathers? What's expected of you as a father? Much. Lots. Show up. <laughs> Spend time with your kids. Pray with your wife. Come on. It's expected, right? It's part of your word. Yes. Unless you go to your wife, honey, I'm not going to pray with you. Okay, no. Well, that could be part of your word too. You would want it to be getting the point here. 
No, what you expect of others is not for you their word. With others you must make your expectations explicit in the form of request. Notice this is a high standard. You hold yourself uh, to a higher standard than you hold anyone else. Okay, if you expect your wife to pray with you, what do you do? You go to your wife and say, I would like you to pray with me. I'm making this request of you. If you want your kids to do something, you make that request of them. You say, as a man of my word, I am making this request of you. I would like it to be part of your word to me. Number four, what you say is so. Whenever you've given your word to others as to the existence of something or some state of the world, your word includes being willing to be held accountable that others would find your evidence makes what you have asserted valid for themselves. So my wife on the way out the door in the morning will say, uh, do you mind feeding the cats and scooping the litter bins? <clears throat> okay. And she calls a little later. I'm working at home grading paper. She calls at 11 o'clock. Did you feed the cats and scoop the litter bins? <laughs> yeah. Did I? If I say yeah and I intend to do it in 30 minutes, am I a man of my word? Is the condition that I've represented now true for her? Well, don't worry, I'm going to do it in 30 minutes. Well, if I haven't done it, okay, suppose that I'm sitting in my study and all of a sudden there's an accident out front. And I run out there as a former EMT and start administering care. And then I get hung up in this and writing a report for the police. And now all of a sudden it's 3 o'clock, my wife gets home, a bunch of hungry cats in a smelly box. But what I said wasn't so, was it? Standing for something. What you stand for, that is, what you say your life is about, and or what you can unquestionably be counted on, whether expressed in the form of a declaration made to one or more people, or even to yourself, as well as what you allow people to believe that you stand for. is part of your word. How many of you got that little fish thing on the back of your car? How many of you got a water boy sticker on the back of your car? What can someone driving behind you expect of you? What kind of statement are you making about yourself? How many of you have ever been cut off on the highway by someone who's got that little fish on the back of their car? Standing for something. How many of us stand for Jesus? You got a water boy's t-shirt on, right? What does that mean? How are you going to behave? That becomes part of your word. You put that t-shirt on. I'm a man of Christ. That becomes part of your word now. You're representing yourself to someone without even saying a word. That becomes part of your word. But remember, what you allow people to believe that you stand for. How many of you have been in a situation where Somebody thinks a little more of you than you sh they should. It gives you a little bit more credit for something, for having done something you really didn't do. You allow them to believe. They kind of revel in the fact that they think I'm really cool. It's like Cartman on the uh, on, on, on South Park, right? You think I'm cool? I want you guys to think I'm cool. You want people to think you're cool. But is that really you? And number six. The moral, ethical, and legal standards, moral, ethical, and legal standards which you have not explicitly declined are part of your word. So as a member of the church, universal, what is now part of your word? Everything you see in that book sitting there in front of you. You acknowledge membership in that church, universal. You acknowledge that the word of God is the truth. That becomes part of your word. Everything in there becomes part of your word. You can be held accountable to that. It becomes part of your word. So, okay, there's your word defined. Six points. Now, what is integrity? Integrity is honoring your word. And honoring your word is, one, keeping your word and on time. Or, whenever you will not be keeping your word just as soon as you become aware that you will not be keeping your word including not keeping your word on time saying to everyone impacted a that you will not be keeping your word and b that you will keep the word in the future and by when or that you won't be keeping your word at all and what you will do to deal with the impact on the others of the failure to keep your word 
or keep it on time. In other words, Hallelujah. clean up the mess. I didn't keep my word. Now notice, it doesn't say if you don't keep your word, does it? It says what? Whenever you will not keep your word. What does the bumper sticker say about stuff happening right now? Hey, stuff happens, right? Uh, I, I know I said I was going to do it, but hey, something happened. Okay, I had a flat tire. I couldn't get there. Well, does that let you off the hook? Someone's depending on you, right? It's not about keeping your word, because there will be times where you cannot keep your word. It's about honoring your word. And honoring your word is either keeping it or, whenever you know you're not going to be keeping it, you let people know right on time, hey, I won't be able to keep my word, but here's what I'm going to do. I will be able to keep it on at another time. And if I can't keep it, here's what I'm going to do to clean up the mess that I'm creating in your life because of failure to keep my word, my commitment to you. How many of you have let yourself off the hook because, hey, something happened. It wasn't my fault. Gave my word. Fully intended to be there. Had every good intention of following through. But, hey, you know, it happens, right? I couldn't get there. Sorry. But someone missed an appointment because you weren't there to take it. Or someone missed out on a meal because you weren't there to deliver it. So, what have you got to do before you give your word? Well, you've got to count the cost. You want to talk about a biblical concept here? Counting the cost. You count the cost when giving your word. The time to count the cost and benefits is when you consider giving your word. Before giving your word, it's wise to weigh the benefits of giving your word against the cost of keeping that word when you give your word, you are in effect saying, I will make that happen. When you are giving your word, you should weigh the benefits you will realize from keeping your word against what it will cost you to honor your word. Because you know once you give it, if you're going to be an authentic man of integrity, you are going to honor it. You are going to make something happen. Or you're going to clean up the mess that's been created as a result. So you've got to count that cost. What is it, Paul? You say you got to... A limited number of yeses, right? Is that the way you put it? I've just got so many yeses up here. And before you give that yes, you've got to count the cost. What's it going to cost me to give this yes? What's the benefit going to be? Well, you're going to deliver a benefit to someone. Okay? By doing that, you actually derive a benefit from yourself because you're honoring God's word. And he commands you to go out and do these things. Take care of the widows and orphans. Okay? So... We may not see that as a benefit to ourselves, but anything we do to follow the command of God is a benefit to us, isn't it? Alright, so the cost, you're doing a cost-benefit analysis. Is it okay to do a cost-benefit analysis on keeping your word as opposed to honoring your word? Well, when it comes to keeping your word, there will be instances when doing a cost-benefit analysis is appropriate. When it comes to keeping your word. However, it is never appropriate to do a cost-benefit analysis on honoring your word. Once you've given your word, if you are to be a man or a woman of integrity, you have no choice but to honor your word. After you've given your word, doing a cost-benefit analysis on honoring your word demonstrates that you're untrustworthy and guarantees that you will not be a person of integrity. Given that integrity is one of the factors of success as a professional and in life, the practice of honoring your word is an important opportunity afforded by this session. So this session, if you take out one thing, you take one thing away from this session, the commitment that I will honor my word. I now under my, understand my word to have six parts. And I now understand that when I give that word, if I am to be a man of integrity, I am to honor that word. And you know what honoring that word means? Either keeping it on time, or if you're not going to keep it on time, tell someone when you will keep it. And if you're not going to keep it, tell them what you're going to do to clean up the mess that's been created. That's how to be a man of integrity, by honoring your word. Don't count the cost when it comes to deciding whether or not to honor it. All right, now this leads us to something called the Law of Integrity. And the Law of Integrity states, as integrity, whole and complete declines, workability declines. And as workability declines, value, or more generally, the opportunity for performance declines. So if you think about this, integrity is going to guarantee workability. How many of you have ever been in a group, a working group before? Professionally, at home, okay? We're managing families, right? 
more than enough to do, more than one person can do. Okay, we make commitments to each other's family members. What happens if someone doesn't honor their word? The work doesn't get done, does it? The outcome isn't quite as valuable as it could have been if everybody had honored their word. So integrity goes directly to workability. Thus maximization, whatever performance measure you choose, requires integrity. Doesn't matter whether you're in the workplace, doesn't matter whether you're at home, doesn't matter whether you're evaluating yourself, okay? Seven minutes a day. How many of us do our seven minutes a day? Every day. Nobody's raising their hand. Okay, well, does that affect the workability of the day? Yeah. How many of you find when you get up in the morning, you do that seven minutes, it affects the workability of your day? I'll tell you what, I was, I was in and out of my home for about four weeks, going to Texas and North Carolina and Illinois and Washington, D.C., meeting with the Federal Reserve Board, advising them on what's going on with their debt policies. You know what I didn't do for almost four weeks? I didn't pray with my wife. You talk about being thrown into a heavy sea without a life ring. I was really, really floundering in some respects because I was out of integrity. I sat down and prayed with my wife this last week. All of a sudden, man, the seas just got calm. And I could see now where I was going all of a sudden. Because what did we pray? We prayed for God's direction. We asked for direction, but it wasn't just me asking. I started praying, it was kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing here, I'm so overwhelmed. And my wife starts in and just clear, visionary, on point. And all of a sudden, now the prayers in me just start to come. Well, I need to be praying about this. Really? I wasn't worried about that. Okay, well, maybe I should be worried about that, okay? So I shouldn't call Paul and say, I can't make it Saturday, I'm going to need a day better. Okay, all of a sudden, things change. Maximization of performance. I had to be in integrity in order for that to happen. I was out of integrity. It wasn't happening. No workability there. Simply put, without integrity, nothing works. Amen. Now, what does it mean to be authentic? Raise your hand. I'm an authentic man. Oh, we're scared now. Here we go. Nobody's raising their hand. Everybody's like, this is a trick question. I'm not going to fall into this trick. You're like the students. I don't commit to anything. If we commit to something, they'll test us on us and we'll be held accountable for it. And who wants to be held accountable, right? Uh, no, let me give you this accountability stuff. Oh, no, no, I'm off the hook here. Okay. What does it mean to be authentic? Being authentic is act, being and acting consistent with who you hold yourself out to be for others, including who you allow others to hold you to be, and who you hold yourself to be for yourself. Whoa! How many of you are the men that you hold yourselves to be for yourself? <clears throat> How many of you are men who hold yourself to be what other people hold you to be? Or do I hear poser? <laughs> well, this is fairly obvious. What is very much less obvious is the path to authenticity. The path to authenticity is being authentic about your inauthenticities. In order to be an effective leader, you need to be willing to discover and confront your inauthenticities and be willing to be authentic about your inauthenticities. Are you being authentic? Most of us think of ourselves as being authentic, however, each of us in certain situations and each of us in certain ways is consistently inauthentic. And because we avoid at all costs confronting our inauthenticities, we are consistently inauthentic about being inauthentic, not only with others, but with ourselves as well. The point is, you are inauthentic and don't know that you're inauthentic, and that's called fooling yourself about fooling yourself. And that's truly foolish. <laughs> That makes sense? <laughs> that is, does it? Eldridge has it a lot easier, right? Poser. One word, poser. That's it, poser. So, quoting a Harvard professor named Chris Argyris, who after 40 years studying human beings, says this, Put simply, people consistently act inconsistently, unaware of the contradiction between their espoused theory 
and their theory in use between the way that they think they are acting and the way they really act. So I'm not cool. So, why is authenticity important? Well, being authentic is critical to being a leader. We're all here because we're trying to be leaders. Inauthenticity is one of the barriers to being a leader and to the effective exercise of leadership. However, attempting to be authentic on top of your inauthenticities is like putting cake frosting on cow dung, thinking that it will make the cow dung go down well. What was it uh, one of the Rolling Stones said? You can't polish a turd. Somebody said that. It's important to recognize your inauthenticities while you won't like seeing them. By distinguishing these weaknesses in yourself, you will give yourself a powerful opportunity to be authentic about your inauthenticities, the pathway to authenticity. Where does this start, gentlemen? Where do I bring my inauthenticities first? To the foot of the cross where they were bought and paid for. Yes, that is why I came, men. Because you are inauthentic, I came for you. I paid with my authenticity so that you could partake in that authenticity. So you could become part of that body of authenticity Woo. that is embodied in Christ. Amen. The authentic man who gives himself for us. So what's a leader? And think about Jesus when you think about this, because I, as soon as this definition came out, I thought, my first thought was, ah, wait a minute, no. And I thought, wait a minute, this is Jesus. What's a leader? One for whom all ways of being and action are available, who is given to being and action in the present that will lead to the realization of a created future that would otherwise not exist and in which the concerns of all relevant parties are fulfilled. <laughs> Is that not Christ coming down, giving up the form of God, becoming a human being, dying on the cross for us? What way of being, what action did he give himself to? How many of us would give us ourselves over to that action of being put on a cross for someone else? How many of you would think, yeah, well, there's an opportunity I can, I can take advantage of as a leader. Would that be in our list of things that I could do as a leader? Die for everybody? No, but what was he willing to do? And how many times do we see Jesus being and acting in a different way? Loving, forgiving. What about that Jesus that went into the <coughs> temple that day and tossed everything out? Can you imagine? I, I, you know, if there's one event I'd love to see the, the video, the replay. I, I would do. Is Jesus going into that church that day, man, just trashing that whole place, you know? Because, you know, when I was five years old, I was like, Jesus loves me, there's something there. Oh, Jesus, that's such a nice guy. He goes, it trashes the place. Yeah. yeah! I want to see that. Righteous rage. A way of being and acting. But appropriate. Not misdirected, but appropriate. So how many ways of being and action do you open up for yourselves? How many of you think, well, if I'm a man, I should do this? If I want to solve the problem, I should do something else. You open yourself up to that way of being, to that action. Oh, I need to be sensitive here. Oh, I need to be tough. I need to be a fixer. No, you need to be sensitive here. You need to listen and shut up for a while. Listen to what your wife's saying. Don't try to fix the problem. Just be there. All right? Doing is a form of language, isn't it? Because people see it. They see what you do. You don't have to speak certain things. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me at work and, and they will apologize for swearing in front of me. I'm like, oh, yeah. well, why are you doing that? Well, because you know, we know you, 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 there's something about you, you don't swear. Well, not at work anyway. <laughs> my, 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 you know, one of my inauthenticities, okay? I went from work to a firehouse and, you know, certain things change, but, okay? So language can, can be either speaking or acting. Now, Paul talked about context. How important is context in the mix here? Okay, how important is context? Having a definition, description, rules, examples, or even a picture of what it is to be a leader and to exercise leadership effectively, while useful in discussing and analyzing leader leadership, will not leave you with being a leader 
or leave you exercising leadership effectively. Whatever, what it is to be a leader and what it is to exercise leadership effectively must exist for you as a context. Context has the power to give you the being of a leader and the actions of effective leadership as your natural self-expression. So let's see some examples of context here. And I'm going to... Okay, read this now with me. Okay, I'm going to read this with you and see if this makes sense. A newspaper is better than a magazine. A seashore is better than a place on the street. At first, it is better to run than to walk. You may have to try several times. It takes some skill, but it's easy to learn. Even young children can enjoy it. Once successful, complications are minimal. Birds seldom get too close. Rain, however, soaks in very fast. Too many people doing the same thing can also cause problems. One needs a lot of room. If there are no complications, it can be very peaceful. A rock will serve it as anchor. If things break loose from it, however, you will not get a second chance. But I tell you what, this puts Jack Kerouac to shame, doesn't it? Stream of consciousness, what? Does this make any sense at all? How many of you look at that and say, yeah, that makes perfectly sense, perfectly good sense? No? Makes no sense? Why? There's no context here, is there? Just a string of words, right? No context. All right? Now I'm going to give it some context, okay? As I pop up the next slide, read it again to yourselves. Is it starting to make sense? It's starting to make sense, isn't it? Why? Because when we think of the context, kite, every one of those sentences makes sense, doesn't it? That's all about flying a kite, isn't it? And why do the words have meaning? And the words have meaning because of the context that we've created for the words. Because of context. Context is decisive. Context is what matters. So mastering the power of context is a leader. To master the power of context, you also must be able to make this statement your own. This is a tough statement. I found that I had difficulty taking ownership of this statement at first, but once I did, I started to transform. <coughs> the way a situation occurs for me, shows up for me, is colored and shaped by my context for that situation, and my way of being and my actions are correlated with the way the situation occurs for me. <coughs> now notice it says correlation, not causation. It's correlation, it's not causation. Why is that? Why is our way of being and action caused, or correlated to a way a situation shows up for us and not caused? Here's the subtlety, because we're not even thinking about it. Because we've got all sorts of preconceived ideas. <clears throat> okay, note that the above statement, what is meant by the word situation, includes not only what is ordinarily understood as a situation, but could also mean a given person, a given group of people, or an entity. So you're walking down the street, you see some guy coming down, right? Leather pants, tattoos, spiked hair, big chain hanging out of his pocket. What's your first, how does that change your way of being? You're on the defensive? How many of you are a little on the defensive now? You're going to walk up to that person and say, Hey, Jesus loves you. What's your inclination? You're not even thinking about it. All of a sudden, you've taken one look at what's happening. All of these judgments are taking place in your mind, right? Based on what? Well, based on previous experiences you've had. Based on things that you haven't thought about. Okay, Unexamined ideas. Things you've been hearing since you're two or three years old, never thought about it. Okay? Where does racism come from? How is it that there's racism? Well, something happened somewhere along the line. Did you ever examine it? Did you ever think about it? Did you ever realize that that becomes your context for the way you interact with people? Well, if you don't think about that as your context, how can you then be a leader? 
you don't understand what your context is. If you don't understand what's your actions, your way of being is correlated to how you change when you walk into a room depending on who's there and what you see. If you don't understand that about yourself, you're not being authentic, are you? And we all have it. doesn't matter who we are. We all have these things. doesn't matter. Good, bad, otherwise. We all have it. We all have to understand that about ourselves. Here's the challenge. Look into your own life and find a context that shapes the way you see a certain situation or a certain person or a certain group of people, or that shapes the way you act with that, within that certain situation, or a certain person, or a certain group of people. So think about your wife. What's the context? What do you think? What do you expect of your wife? What's your view of your wife? How does that influence your way of being around your wife? How does that influence your actions around your wife? Think about that. What's the context for that relationship? And how does that shape your performance as a leader? You're the leader in your household. You're the leader in your marriage. Tough responsibility, but God's order, it falls on us. Sometimes it's a lousy place to be. Sometimes I don't want to be there. You know, I'd rather say, I'm going to do what you want to do. I don't care. You know, my wife's struggling over an opportunity right now. She's praying about it. She's been offered an opportunity. And she's struggling with whether or not to respond. She comes to me and says, well, I want your input on this. And in the past, when I've given my input sometimes, I've been told I've been controlling and intrusive. And so I've kind of learned, yeah. what is that you want to do? But now she's coming to me. What do I have to do? I have to put away those unexamined ideas that, hey, you're the controlling intruder, don't give any advice. Well, maybe I'm not here to give advice. Maybe I'm here to lead her in prayer. And put this in God's hands and say, God, this is your choice. You tell us what you have planned for us. Changing my context. Okay, so now, if you were to take that beginning quiz again, scoring yourself 1 to 10, given that you've now had some background in what it means to be an authentic man of integrity, write down today's, write down the score right now, right underneath the other one, write down your current score. Now that you've had some background here, now that you've been given some insights on what it is to be an authentic man of integrity, write down your score. Now take the top minus the bottom. Is that a positive number? <laughs> There's your challenge, gentlemen. Be a man of your word. Honor your word. Be authentic about your inauthenticities. And be a leader of being in action. Amen.